I studied filmmaking in the US during the 70s. Recently, I've been doing talk shows on the voiceless dissidents, those that deserve to be heard but are silenced by the corporate media. The Treasury Department of the present Trump administration sanctioned me and my colleagues. I must have harassed them. We we'll continue the show right here from my home. I am Nadir Talib Zadeh on Nadir's show. On Nadir's show. Greetings. Our next guest is a professor from Sydney, Australia, whose views on the realities of the world have cost him his position in the academia. Today, he is challenging these in the Sydney courts. We'll talk about these views in this program and why he is challenged. So stay tuned. Dr. Tim Anderson is an Australian academic and activist. He has degrees in economics and international politics and a doctorate in the political economy of economic liberalization in Australia. Dr. Tim Anderson is a senior lecturer in political economy at the University of Sydney. He researches and writes on independent development, rights in development, regional integration, human rights, and self-determination in the Asia-Pacific region, Latin America, and the Middle East. He has published dozens of articles and chapters in academic journals and books, as well as essays in a range of online journals. His work includes the areas of agriculture and food security, health systems, regional integration, and international cooperation. His last two books were Land and Livelihoods in Papua New Guinea, 2015, and The Dirty War on Syria, 2016, now published in 10 languages. The Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies was formed by Anderson and other academics in early 2016 after concern that many Western academic bodies constrain, censor, and marginalize counter-hegemonic or anti-imperial research and discussion due to their close ties with government and corporate sponsors. The CCHS is an initiative to publish and promote quality research and discussion on counter-hegemonic themes and issues in support of independent nations and the internationally recognized right of all peoples to self-determination. Thank you very much, Dr. Anderson. It's uh, great to have you on the show all the way from Australia. Thank you. Um, yeah, from seeing what you're doing and your activities, you're one of the rare cases of a Western intellectual who knows a, a more about Iran than most do. And when I was looking at your article called Lessons from the Iranian Revolution, I realized how far back many in the West are about what, what happened here in 1979. <coughs> so, and with all the um, competition and uh, potential conflicts going on right now in the Persian Gulf, um, things are ascending, not to a crescendo necessarily, but they're pretty tense, especially with the British, which is the first time after centuries where there's a uh, direct confrontation, and uh, I will see what happens out of this. Now, Dr. Anderson, you um, in Australia, please tell me about, I think there is a, there's a almost deliberate mass ignorance about what the Islamic Republic is, what it represents, what, what happened in 1979 in Iran, and they, they, they want to maintain this mass ignorance to be able to perform what they want to do. I'd like to start there. Uh, and I think that you've worked on different issues that always goes back to this. If, if you're kind to them, you say general misunderstanding, but I think it's more pointed and more deliberate than that. And you know that. 
So let's begin with the, the focus on what happened in 1979 and the result after four decades and where we stand and what they, have, what they have said about the Islamic Republic has turned basically to be untrue, that we are a terrorist state, etc. So you have the floor. <coughs> yes, you're right to start with 1979 because without understanding that history, including the, the terrible war which most of the world backed against Iran uh, when it was a very young republic. Um, that background has been missing, but of course there are contradictions and weaknesses in the story that we get in this country. Um, you're right to say that there is uh, quite systematic disinformation. We have a very centralized media, more centralized even than in Britain or, or the United States. It's controlled by a small handful of companies. And they quite uh, aggressively enforce um, at particular times the propaganda line. For example, when um, the, the attacks on myself and my colleagues over Syria began just when President Trump made his first missile strikes on Syria. So that it wasn't a coincidence that the, the corporate media here came in to try and wipe out any opposition to the story at that time, which was, you know, about killing civilians and chemical weapons, all of the weapons of mass destruction story that they, they keep running in Western media. And even though everyone knows they were fooled about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq, uh, less than a decade later on, they're still buying this story. Or, or it, It's harder for them to do it, though, because remember, one effect of the JCPOA was that um, as soon as that was signed, and the Europeans were keen to do business in Tehran. We had a foreign minister who rushed off to Tehran. She had a scarf on her head and she was there shaking hands and doing business very quickly. So they're nothing if not flexible, these types. Unfortunately, when it comes to the Middle East, the, the uh, in Canberra, whichever major party is in power, are very beholden to the US side of things. A little bit more autonomy in this part of the world here, but in the Middle East, they have their own ambitions uh, economically in terms of trade, but in terms of foreign policy, they there isn't really a war that they haven't joined Washington in. And the the corporate media here is very loyal to that uh, to that line, or rather, it's probably the other way around. Really, the corporate media, the oligarchy that runs this country, uh, determines the political line of the of the the government of the day. So there isn't too much. There's not too many rays of light coming through that that wall. But I think there is a, a weariness and I, I think there's a recognition that Iran is a, a great power in the region and that a war is going to be catastrophic. And so there is um, there's some reticence, there's some some small lessons have been learned about that, I think. But nevertheless, we have a government here that's pledged to even if they, whether whether they like Mr. Trump or not, they, they've pledged to back the US for their uh, reasons of their traditional patronage. Also, um, I understand that uh, you as a professor in, in Sydney, in, in, in Australia, um, have been limited in, in what you're saying. And, and tell us about this conflict where Whereas, I mean, I remember uh, back in the 70s where I was studying in the U.S., in, in the class you could discuss anything. But I know the world has changed since then in the U.S. too. You cannot discuss some, some things in class. There are red lines now. But, uh, and I think Australia is, is no different than Washington or New York or San Francisco in that, in that regard. How have you been isolated as a professor um, in what you say in your class? Well, you know, for a long time there wasn't, too much, uh, there wasn't too much uh, pressure as in recent times. And it's been to do with uh, the red lines that you mentioned are uh, really to do with the current conflicts. Uh, for example, you can say anything you like about the invasion of Iraq now or the destruction of Libya, because in, in a sense, the, job, the deed is done, you know, the evil has been done. And they laugh about the lies that they told about Libya and about Iraq, but they're still very sensitive to the lies about Syria, the war on Syria, even though it's been going on for nine years. And there are more people who have come to learn uh, some through some independent sources about that war. Uh, in relation to Palestine, of course, um, there is a 
an, a, 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 what do you say, a subterranean sense of sympathy with the Palestinians, but nevertheless, the Israeli uh, lobby has a very strong influence here still. So the red lines in respect of Israel are ones rather aggressively enforced. Um, when it comes to Iran, it's not so clear because there's been a toing and froing. I remember actually back in 2010, you may recall that there was a a great deal of tension at that time under the then President Bush, and there was a, there was an enormous tension back at that time. So it, then the JCPOA came into place in in very unusual circumstances, uh, in the sense that the US had some partners with the Europeans and Russia and China, an extraordinary sort of coalition at that stage. That's all fallen apart. But now Mr. Trump has decided to ramp up the uh, the war, at least the economic war and the propaganda war. Um, so, you know, there's been a lot of to's and fro's with the with the messages people are getting here. And I think there's a fair degree of confusion about um, about really what's going on, because uh, President Trump is not very popular, as you may know, or a very controversial figure in Western countries, uh, including in, in Australia. Um, I mean, things are a little bit different here to in the US. Uh, for example, my next book, which is being published, is being published in the US because there are still, I couldn't get it published in Australia, but there are uh, enough now uh, alternative media, let's say, that you can, you can publish certain things in the US that you could not publish here. Um, I think you, though you started to talk about the university, um, I was dismissed from my university in February this year for saying some things that they regarded as offensive to Israel. Now that's being contested in a court case at the moment and my lawyers are urging me not to say very much about it because it will make things more complicated for them. But just to say that the, the Israel lobby has it has a lot of power and it's there's quite a number of academics against whom they, they've launched themselves to try and shut down criticism of Israel. And of course, Israel's behind you know, a lot of the driver behind the war on Syria, behind the, uh, of course, um, you know, the conflict in Palestine and behind the the conflict on Iran too. It's it's really a lot of it come emanates from from Israel. Uh, uh, Dr. Anderson, I want to go to uh, a word, conspiracy theory, uh, that has come to the fore uh, ever since 1979 and the Islamic Revolution. Suddenly, I mean, this word had a different weight back in the old days. Uh, conspiracy theory, oh, oh there, there are UFOs, there, there's life in some other planets. Somebody, th those were conspiracy theories. They're, they're potentially, they're Martians, they're other uh, <clears throat> existence, things like that. Or there was, there's, there's life that's going to come from another planet to this. I mean, things that would in inflict sort of a, a sort of worrisome attitude, psychology. But after 1979, Conspiracy theory has gained a different meaning. Anyone who challenges the mainstream media, the corporate media's line, is now a, a very they're dismissed as a conspiracy theorist. For example, we have a conference in Iran called the New Horizon, which we've been holding for the past decade. And the, 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 the Haaretz line from Israel is it's a coalition of conspiracy theorists. And they start naming different people. It could be a rabbi, it could be a guy named, born in Israel, it could be uh, any, uh, an, an American colonel, it could be a, a former U.S. senator, but they're all conspiracy theorists. They've banded them together with one word, late, stigmatized them with one word. Tell me about this strategy in, in the West that developed with stigmatizing and then dismissing. Like anybody who has a different line about 9-11 is a conspiracy theorist. It doesn't matter if you're 3,000 engineers and architects who are talking about how could those buildings come down. Or anybody who talks about anything that would uh, contrast the mainstream line of the corporate media becomes a conspiracy theorist. They've been, I mean, this is a very strategic word they've used, and it's been used successfully. Yes, you might say the same thing about anti-Semitic people and people who are criticizing Israel. <laughs> they've, they've weaponized some propaganda terms, it's true. Um, I mean, the answer to that, though, in terms of conspiracy theorists is, um, is really evidence, isn't it? You, know, you present evidence about what's going on in the war. You know, recently, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, evidence has emerged that 
The US is training large number of armed people in Al Tanf base in South Syria, and they're stealing Syria's oil to help pay for it. Uh, and that really sums up a great deal of what the US occupation of Syria is about at the moment, you know. So when you present people with with evidence, it, it's easy for them to um, it's easy for them to to form their own conclusions. So I think it's true they've weaponized terms. They've also um, uh, colonized our language in many respects. For example, uh, the color revolutions of recent years. Everything's a revolution. Al Qaeda throat cutters are rebels. You know, um, activists are people who are paid to spread lies. You know, unfortunately, you know it makes you cringe from wanting. They used to have progressive meanings, didn't they? Rebels and uh, activists and revolutions and so on. So there's been a colonization of language in terms of weaponizing these these sorts of terms, you know, and that's part of the propaganda war, isn't it? Really, today's wars, to my mind, are a hybrid of propaganda wars that's become very important with highly educated populations, economic wars, um, terrorist wars, unconventional wars and uh, conventional wars all put together. I think in the US they call it something like full spectrum dominance. They want to dominate people culturally, ideologically, uh, economically, every which way. Okay, thank you. L let me jump to some current um, affairs that has, is affecting everyone. It's a few weeks past after Iran downed the U.S. drone, and there are many articles and many reactions worldwide, in, from, from China, from India, from Russia, from South America, those people who have been colonized in the past and are right now being threatened anyway by the U.S. Tell me about this atmosphere right now. I mean, and, and the, the second stage of it is the taking, the, the taking of ships. One, Iran took a ship, they took a ship, they're standing off. Talk, I want your opinion about this standoff. What does it mean? What, what's its significance? What, what sort of moment are we living in right now? Well, it seems to me as an observer that uh, there's a type of shadow boxing going on, isn't there? That there is this economic war, a very intense economic war. Uh, it is a war too. It's, it's not quite clearly illegal. Uh, it's a war in, in the aggressive sense. It's an attempt to put countries under siege. I mean, virtually every independent country in the whole West Asian region is under some form of economic war at the moment. There are sanctions against particular groups in Lebanon, in Iraq, against the whole of Syria, against the whole of Iran. So Yemen and Palestine are under siege. In those circumstances, the these sorts of, uh, you know, seizing uh, a tanker headed for Syria because the European Union decided that uh, the Syrians shouldn't have uh, oil, you know, shouldn't have energy. Um, in the meantime, the US is sitting on their oil reserves and some of their food reserves and trying to starve them. This is old fashioned siege warfare, basically. Now, when it comes to the, the tankers and the drones, you know, there's, um, um, there's clearly some sort of sizing up going on, some sort of shadow war going on. Uh, neither side really wants a war. I think that's clear. I, I mean, I tend to share the opinion uh, that a number of others have expressed that whatever the faults of the US administration, they're not completely stupid. They, they understand that there are some serious consequences and uh, if they go too far in provoking Iran and that the, the risk of escalation is something unclear. It's one of the first cardinal rules of war that you don't get into a fight if you can't foresee where it's going to go and they have trouble foreseeing where it may go, basically. So I think these issues of, uh, you know, seizing a tanker, probably it was a, a foolish thing, really, but in a sense, they're running on their own contradictions now. I'm not quite sure, to tell you the truth, how the UK, UK sits in the European context these days, what with Brexit, given that the Europeans are apparently making some sort of efforts to try and maintain the, the nuclear deal on foot. And certainly there's, there's a looming split between the European Union and the US, which is uh, notable because the US has been dominating Europe for so long through NATO and the links between the EU and NATO have become rather closer in recent times. Um, and that's part of the reason behind the dissent with, with uh, the EU. In other words, there's a game at play where the role of the US in Western Europe is 
in state at, at stake basically and this is one of the reasons why they're they're trying to prevent a normal relationship between Russia and Western and Western uh, Europe. But the role of Britain in this and the tankers, um, I'm not quite sure where it's going. I'm not sure if they know where it's going, really. They certainly don't have any independent capacity, independent of the US, to carry out some sort of aggression against Iran. We saw uh, those of us who study history would remember what happened when the British and the French attacked Egypt over, over the Suez Canal. If the US, the US didn't back them up there and they lost. And of course, that led to the, to the, the great rise in status of, uh, of former President Nasser in, in Egypt. So the British can't act really independently here. They're dependent on their, on their um, big brother. Right. Uh, yeah, I'd like to go to Trump because there's a very interesting article you have on uh, Trump's desperate measures against Iran could lead to U.S. isolation. Um, I mean, it's, it's a phenomena that we have Trump today. And I know that you're sitting in Australia, but from where you're sitting, when, when you, you, you can read, you can read what's happening within the U.S., there's a big divide. I mean, you've never seen a mainstream media like New York Times or Washington Post or CNN so obsessive about anti-Trumping uh, as this period. I mean, I've, I've been sort of, uh, since adult age, I've been watching since Nixon, what's been going on. You never had this situation as you have today. And this very uh, deep abyss, this divide that is occurring in America. <clears throat> Many predict that Trump will win the election because he does have support among different groups, including the Christian evangelists, etc. But you yourself, as someone who comes from this Western background, this you know the West, you're in the West, you've been stigmatized by the educational system for speaking out freely about what you believe to the younger generation. How do you, what do your tentacles say about what is about to occur in America? I don't want you to say prophesy anything. I'm just saying Trump is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, and I think that... Um, he is, he is, they call him the wild card. He's the guy nobody predicted would take over. Um, and um, what, what do you read into this? I mean, what do you read into what Trump might take things and, and how things might, might culminate into with this, this guy at the helm? Look, at one level, I'm a political economist and I look at the, the continuity of structures in states like the US and in some respects it is a alternating between a, a so-called liberal uh, imperialist approach and a realist imperialist approach one to the other and they share a great deal you know Trump has a certain style which clearly grates with a lot of uh, American liberals and I think uh, and and grates with their self-image and I think that's a fair bit to do with the with the divide there there's something funny that's happened and you would recognize this being an observer since at least the 70s or the 60s is that remember there they used to talk about hawks and doves and the hawks were the realists you know the ones that wanted war and the doves were the people the liberals and the people that wanted to talk and have diplomacy and so on and and yet in this century in the 21st century it's precisely the liberals or the american liberals who are the greatest uh, proponents of this um, smart power and humanitarian war, you know, going to war to save people from their own regimes and so on. They, they ran that in Libya, they ran it in Syria, they tried to run it again in Nicaragua and Venezuela. Um, it's, it's the liberals that have been driving this and the, the one set of things that Trump does where the New York Times and the Washington Post and the liberal establishment of uh, or uh, of the U.S. supports him. It's when he does go to war, when he makes a missile strike or he makes an attack, they do tend to rally behind Trump when he does something more aggressive like that. Uh, when he talks about women and gays and black people and so on and immigrants, you know, the liberals get very upset about that. But when he carries out a missile strike on Syria on the basis of some stupid false flag incident carried out by an Al Qaeda group. Um, they all rally behind him, you know, so there's a strange sort of solidarity going on in that system. And really, 
I don't see a huge amount of difference. I mean, let's take one example. The, the, the decision to move the U.S. embassy to Al-Quds, Jerusalem. Trump did that where previous presidents had uh, hesitated, but it was uh, supported by a motion of U.S. Congress in 1996, more than 20 years ago, and almost all the Congress supported it. No one opposed it. Ten abstained. So there's a great institutionality behind some of these sorts of things. It's the Congress that appropriates billions of dollars a year to Israel. You know, so it's although there's a bit of toing and froing as to whether um, you know the 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 American Jews support the Republicans or the Democrats, but nevertheless the the support for for Israel has been rather constant. And now you've got an interesting contradiction emerging. I think it's interesting that. Uh, liberal Jews in the U.S. Um, don't like Trump for all the reasons that liberals don't like Trump. Um, and they don't like Netanyahu either, but probably they support Israel. So they want to see a nicer, friendlier Israel is the way I, I see it there. Whereas they polled them and Jews in Israel are now saying, well, you know, we like Trump because not necessarily because we like Netanyahu, but he's been very supportive of Israel and unreserved in support of Israel. So there is this widening split emerging between liberal Jews in the US and Israeli Jews. And I think that's quite interesting and quite an important contradiction that's going on there. And Trump is helping bring those sorts of things to a head, just as he's bringing certain things to a head internationally. Uh, for example, the split with the Europeans, uh, Trump has been threatening just about everyone. He's been threatening their their friends as well as their enemies. You know, threatening Germany to not buy gas from Russia. Um, there's hardly anyone that Trump has not threatened, basically. And this is all contributing to something of an isolation of the U.S. The U.S. is trying to use simply more or less uh, brute force of economic the threat of economic sanctions. It's got a, an economic war with China. Uh, and Russia, and um, it's he's really forcing things to a point where, you know, the Europeans are creating this instex to try and create new uh, financial channels to keep doing some sort of business with Iran. The Chinese are moving ahead with their um, Belt and Road and Shanghai cooperation mechanism and trading more in their own currencies rather than the US dollar. So Trump seems to be exacerbating these sorts of um, problems for the US, which may uh, may be a case of the US shooting itself in its own foot, basically. But in terms of the internal politics of the US, yes, the Democrats um, are really too captured by the corporations there to uh, risk it with a more left liberal candidate. And so we might have a result as we had with uh, Clinton and Trump that in a sense, the most uh, reactionary unpopular candidate, maybe Joe Biden, gets put up there. And you may be right, Trump gets a second term out of that. But I see the US as a big ship, which is really not changing course that much through the the by the, the, the two party system there, basically. Um, some people say, um, and they say that um, Trump is, is the man who's going to determine the fate of the empire. What do you say about that? Well, yeah, I was starting to touch on that, um, that, you know, how most empires end is with an overreach, you know, Napoleon trying to reach Moscow, Hitler trying to reach Moscow, everyone trying to reach Moscow. Um, they go too far and they, they spread themselves too thin and they lose everything in the end. And I think the, the big game going on at the moment, the, 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 great, the great game of the day really is Eurasia, Eurasian integration, the, the, the network of economic integration between East Asia and, um, and Western Europe, let's say, with the Middle East or West Asia in between. Now, this is a game that threatens the US enormously because of course, the economic potential of that integration is quite substantial and uh, the players in the middle stand to benefit from it too, but the US has relied uh, to a great deal on its influence in Western Europe and is trying to maintain its, um, desperately maintain its uh, presence in the Middle East to try and, apart from anything else, to try and block that integration between the East and the West. So, um, of course, if there were 
natural, normal relations between China, Russia, and Western Europe. Um, and if there were friendly relations between Russia and, and Western Europe, what's the need for NATO? What's the need for the US to be in uh, Western Europe um, determining or, or domineering policy in the European Union? This has got something to do with um, the root of some of the tensions within the European Union there too. They feel they're being dictated to by agendas which are not really even set by the Europeans. So there's a big game there going which, which sort of overarches a great deal of what's happening in the Middle East. And as I said before, I, I think Trump is exacerbating these contradictions. Um, certainly, I believe he's pushing the US into a more isolated position. Look at the nuclear deal. Um, for some unusual reason, the US had as allies against Iran uh, some years ago. How many years ago was it when it began? Maybe 15 years ago. Uh, they had Russia, China and Western Europe all against Iran. Iran was in a very difficult situation. Uh, now, um, they don't have really any of those allies. They have a lot of economic uh, power over Europe still because of the integration of large corporations in Europe and the North America. But their position is becoming more tenuous. You, you mentioned, um, among many other things that you mentioned very well, is uh, the thing about Russia. Uh, it's interesting you mentioned both Napoleon and Hitler. And uh, this obsession about Russia, you have this situation today ongoing when you s switch on CNN, this uh, Russia gate and uh, uh, the case of um, the obsession about the connection between Trump and Russia. Um, um, why, why are the enemies of Trump so concerned about Russia? Why, why is that an important influence? Well, I think it's... Uh at a superficial level, it's uh, sour grapes, you know. Why did Hillary lose the election? It was an unlosable election against a very ugly candidate. It was, you know, Hillary, all the opinion polls, all the media thought Hillary was going to win, and they had to blame someone. But at a deeper level, I believe that really, you know, every empire or would-be empire, uh, their concern is greatest with... Uh, uh, or their jealousy is greatest over the next big power that's going to take their place. Not to say that Russia is an empire in itself, but uh, empires are always paranoid. You know, the, the, the big, um, the king of the roost, the king chick, the king rooster is always worried about, or the king lion is worried about the next one that's come, going to come along and knock them off. And I think that's the way the US sees both China and Russia, basically. They are big powers in their own right. Um, Iran is big power, but in the context of West Asia, in context of the Middle East. Um, but globally speaking, Russia and China are the big threats. And in a sense, you know, it was said that there was some perhaps plot to try and get Russia as a partner against China, and that didn't work. And the Russia-China integration is moving ahead more strongly than ever, ever now. But I think that's the way the US sees it. They see that Russia having a good relationship with Western Europe is going to be at the expense of US influence in Western Europe, for example. Hence, all of the plans in, West, West, in Eastern Europe, sorry, to, to try and line up those states, Poland, uh, Ukraine, weak dependent states, Poland and Ukraine, to try and block. Um, and they did try and block, for example, the, the sale of gas into Western Europe, but they haven't been able to, they haven't succeeded with that, basically. So uh, Russia is playing an important role also because it's exerted more under Mr. Putin, has exerted more uh, independent political will on the world stage. The Chinese have been more cautious, of course, because economically they're very codependent with the US and they wanted that relationship to keep on going. And it's really the US and Trump in particular who's um, um, forced China to take more independent steps. China was, was winning. China had a huge trade surplus. They were very happy with that relationship, um, now the US is forcing them to take a more independent position. And uh, it's like trying to hold back the tide, isn't it? Saying to try and fight uh, the power, the economic power of China. It's obviously the new force of this century. Um, it's going to be the biggest, the biggest economy by far in, in a very short period of time. So Russia and China, I think, are, are going to remain obsessions for the entire 
US establishment. But in terms of the internal politics of them claiming that uh, Trump was somehow, you know, had some secret deal with Russia, this is the real conspiracy theories. <laughs> you talk about conspiracy theories, you know, saying that Russia had manipulated everything, that everything that goes on to the misfortune of the, the deep state in the US, including Hillary Clinton losing elections. Um, where I, I haven't yet, I've yet to see much evidence about that one. My, my final question, because we ran out of time, but what you're saying is so interesting, um, is I think also, if I may uh, say, that uh, Russia's position with Iran uh, in this sort of axis of resistance uh, will definitely tee off a lot of people, including inside of Iran, a lot of Russophobic people. Uh, the fact that uh, Russia is in Syria today, uh, just as we're speaking, there's a maneuver with the Russian Navy and the Iranian Navy. Why would they have an, uh, you know, a compatible maneuver right now and in these tense times? So um, also this, this uh, Russia gate has a lot to do, I think, with the way Russia has been uh, going along with Iran, actually in the war in Syria, actually boots on the ground, and jets in the air. Um, mm. Do you see that also as a, as a key factor in the phobia that Russia has right now for the Americans? Well, I mean, uh, I don't start from the point of view of looking at how the Americans see it because they have their own illusions about the world, you know, and, and they have their own phobia about, uh, about other big powers. But um, it is a very interesting relationship, isn't it, Russia and Iran? I don't see Russia as part of the axis of resistance, really, because it has some other major agendas in the world. It is defending Syria, no doubt about that. Um, but it has this relationship with Israel, which compromises that defense. And uh, it doesn't share that same agenda that Iran and Iraq and Syria and the resistance in Lebanon and Palestine do. So, or Yemen, I should include Yemen there. But uh, it's an important ally. No doubt it's an important ally. And I think uh, there was a very interesting interview with a, a Lebanese man, uh, Anis Nakash. You may have heard him talking about that and how the, how the relationship um, developed and how there is, you know, some strategic coincidences between Iran and Russia. And I think, you know, both sides have shown themselves mature in diplomacy to maintain relationships with countries with whom they are in other respects in serious conflict. Um, and, you know, we've seen, for example, Iran's relationship with Turkey and with Qatar, for example, you know, um, and, and Russia's relationship with Turkey, um, while Turkey is very deeply involved in this, uh, certainly in the North war in the North part of Syria at the moment. So, you know, mature players can manage those sorts of contradictions, but there, uh, there are, important differences there, but I don't think that's necessarily fatal. I think the people that say, on the one hand, that Russia is saving Syria or that Russia is stabbing Syria in the back are, are both wrong. And <laughs> There's something else going on there. Russia is an important ally of Iran and, and Syria, and uh, but there are some limits to that. Okay, I, I think that sums it up uh, for the time that we have right now. I really enjoy talking with you and um, I hope that we get a chance again to have a discussion. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Anderson. I wish you health and success in, in your endeavors in the ac academia and also what you're contributing to world knowledge about what's really going on. Thank you very much. Okay. So farewell to you. Okay, farewell. Take care. Take care. Thank you very much. I hope you have enjoyed the show. We pray that Professor Tim Anderson wins his case and continues enlightening the youth at his university.